Hello and welcome to Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley, brought to you every Saturday on Premier Christian Radio, but broadcasting around the world via our podcast. And I'm very excited to say that today's show is a special one, uh, partly because of the guests I've got on, one of whom will be at this year's Unbelievable Conference 2019. Yes, it's happening Saturday, the 20th of July at Westminster Central Hall, London, and the ticketing is now officially open. So all of those who've been getting in touch saying, when will you you be releasing details how can i book my ticket it is possible to do that right now at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable conference or you can find it from the unbelievable webpage as well uh, but it's going to be a great day on saturday the 20th of july we're inviting you to join the revolution and speak truth in a post-truth world that's our conference title this year in partnership this time with biola apologetics and adf international i think we're actually seeing a new generation of confident christians being raised up unbelievable is part of that story but this is going to be a day specifically to equip you to share the truth of christianity in a world full of fake news uh, there's going to be seminars on creating better conversations, responding to atheism, Islam, other worldviews, and generally being a confident Christian in a world that often wants to shut down dialogue. Sound fun? Well, check out the speakers we've got confirmed so far. They include Professor J.P. Moreland, who we're hearing from on today's show, and Craig Hazen, both from Biola, and more speakers to be confirmed. Um, Paul Coleman and Andy Tonhauser of ADF International. They'll be leading seminars on some hot-button issues like gay cakes, abortion, and religious freedom. Uh, Sarah Lumger on Islam and Youth Apologetics. Really looking forward to having Sarah back at the conference. She's been with us before under her pre-married name, uh, Sarah Foster. Uh, Krish Kandaya joins us, uh, evangelist and author on creating better conversations with those you disagree with. Such a great communicator, Krish. And uh, from the other side of the pond as well, another great communicator, Bruxy Cavey. I'm just a huge fan of Bruxy's. He's pastor of The Meeting House in Toronto, Canada. And he's going to be talking about how to make the good news of Jesus relevant to sinners saints and skeptics uh, Ruth Jackson and Emily Howarth of Premier Youth and Children's Work will be with us to lead the youth stream and with more speakers to be announced it's very exciting unbelievable the conference 2019 Saturday the 20th of July do check out the lineup so far the theme uh, and how to book for the cheap early bird ticket price as well there's also student and group discounts available at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable conference book in now and join the revolution. Let's get into today's show. You're unbelievable. Today on the show, we're asking, is scientism the new religion? Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland and atheist philosopher Stephen Law join me on today's show. Uh, J.P. Moreland is a distinguished professor of philosophy at Biola University in California. He's the author of many books, and his latest, Scientism and Secularism, Learning to Respond to a Dangerous Ideology, is out now. Uh, as I've already said, JP will be part of an awesome lineup of speakers at this year's Unbelievable Conference 2019 in central London on Saturday, the 20th of July. Stephen Law is a humanist philosopher who edits the philosophical journal Think. He's also the author of various books, including The War for Children's Minds and Believing BS. You know what that stands for. Uh, how not to get sucked into an intellectual black hole. This is the family-friendly version, you understand, Stephen, of the show. Uh, back in 2011, he famously debated a well-known colleague of JP's, William Lane Craig, in a live London debate for Unbelievable. But that seems a long time ago now, Stephen, would you say? Yes. Well, yeah. it is quite a long time it ago. It was. Yeah. <laughs> Seven years ago or more. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, anyway, I'm looking forward to today's show as we debate the limits of science as a route to knowledge and whether naturalism or theism provides a better explanatory framework for the things that science can't tell us. Uh, now, you may be thinking, isn't this a bit like that conversation between John Lennox and Peter Atkins you had on a few weeks ago, Justin? Well, admittedly, the topics do overlap, but I think we'll be covering quite a lot of different ground this time round. So I'm, I'm looking forward to today's show. Uh, so uh, JP and Stephen, welcome along to the programme today. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you. JP, let's start with you as a newcomer to the show. First time on the show. Can't believe we haven't had you on before, really. Um, uh, very much looking forward to having you over in the UK as well in July for the Unbelievable Conference. Um, do, do you get to come to the UK much uh, or will this be the first time in a while? Uh, it'll be the first time in a while. I've been there two or three times, but uh, I don't come over very often. Well, I'm glad that we've given you a good excuse to, to visit our fair city of London and um, to talk about what you do and obviously present some of these seminars and talks at this year's Unbelievable Conference. I'm sure 
this book that we're going to be looking at today will will feature as part of that um well i'm looking forward to it uh, absolutely um let's let's talk about this book because you you begin the book actually by talking about how you almost went into a career in science initially uh though you ended up obviously in philosophy tell us about how that happened jp well i was an undergraduate a physical chemistry major and uh i was accepted to do a phd in nuclear chemistry at a major university here in the united states but my junior year In college, I was converted uh, to be a Jesus follower, and chemistry would have been a wonderful career, but I started getting interested in philosophical questions, and I, at that point, thought philosophy was psychology misspelled. (laughs) I had absolutely no idea what it was, but uh, I I grew an interest in it and then eventually got my MM and PhD. So you've always been fascinated by science. And your book, yes. in many ways, is a call to to do science better because you believe actually it's in many ways today overstepped the boundaries of what it's supposed to do for us. Well, yes, and I think that the culture in Western culture, certainly American culture, has accepted, without knowing the name of it, uh, an epistemology of scientism, and uh, thus science has an authority. Uh, that it ought not have, and it has authority in areas where, quite frankly, science is just unable to speak to. So my book is an attempt to kind of defend more of a pluralistic view of knowing that there are ways of knowing and that there are limits to science, and scientism is not a rational position to hold. We'll get to defining science in a moment's time, uh, scientism, I should say, but Um, Is it your feeling that, I don't know, is it the last 50 years or so that this particular kind of scientism has really taken hold in your view? I think it would be a little bit longer than that. I I think uh, in America, there's a a book called The Origin of the Making of the Modern University uh, that traces the development of scientism from 1880 up till about the Scopes trial in the mid 1920s. So uh, from that time, it began to develop, but I don't think we saw it flowering until uh, uh, the 30s, 40s, 50s, Uh, and then Kuhn's book comes out and and all chaos breaks loose. (laughs) Uh, So uh, it's it's an odd history, but I do think it's been gaining steam in the last few decades, as you pointed out. Mm. Um, We'll come back to you in a moment's time for more on scientism. Um, Stephen, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I think I said before we came on air that uh, it's been something like two and a half years, I think, since you were last on. So time flies. It does. I think um, you've often been on to debate issues like how can we know that what we know is reliable and that sort of thing epistemology uh, as it's sometimes called to give it its technical title you've even been on with people like alvin plantinger in the past to debate yeah. that yeah. um but you just because we've had a little bit of an intro to, to jp I, I think you had a kind of unusual way into philosophy as well yourself didn't you? you didn't sort of start on the academic route exactly that's true actually yeah so i um i had a couple of goes at doing a levels mm which is what you do in this country before you go to university. I had a couple of shots at that. The first time I was asked to leave. Um, the second <laughs> Can time, you tell us why? <laughs> well, I was just a good-for-nothing <laughs> hippie, basically. Okay. And uh, the, the second time I left because I've just found it so dull. Right. And I ended up being uh, doing various jobs, but uh, one, one of which was I was a postman for um, Cambridge um, for about four years. Um, right. I used to do a lot of reading, thinking, and eventually I realised that there was this subject, philosophy, that actually, you know, you could study, mm. and it was the focus of many of, you know, many of the questions that I was particularly int- particularly interested in and spent a lot of time thinking about and reading about. And once I discovered that, I thought, well, actually, I would really like to go to university and study this, despite not having the usual formal qualifications to do so. And by some miracle, I actually managed to talk my way into a uh, university to study um, at the City University uh, yeah. in London to begin with. And from there, and I did, did well. From there, I went to Oxford. 
did the BPhil, did the the doctorate. I was a research fellow there, and then I moved to Heathrop College. So it goes to show that sometimes you just need to find the right thing that sparks the imagination, and then the rest yes. follows. Yeah, yeah. But um, you're an atheist, um, and that, in a sense, has that always been the case? Has your philosophy always appeared to support that worldview? Um, yeah. I mean, I th- I think I started off in my twenties as I mentioned, as a bit of a hippie and with, with an interest in the transcendent. and mm. I became more sceptical as I did more philosophy um, about that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I'd still like to think that I was you know, open-minded, but the fact is that, no, I'm not persuaded that there's any kind of transcendent realm. I don't believe in any gods or, do you, and so on. Do you wear a label like naturalist? No, not? no, I don't like those labels at all. Mm. Um I am an atheist. I would describe myself as a humanist. I'm not sure what, it, which, what naturalism even means. Um, people often assume that all you know, philosophers and scientists nowadays, they're all naturalists. Actually, there was a poll done of professional philosophers and graduate students a few years ago, the Phil Papers survey, which revealed that only about half of professional philosophers and graduate students even lean towards our naturalism okay but, so but if, if say naturalism was defined as something like all that ultimately exists are the natural forces matter energy motion and so on that's that's it all boils down to that yeah that may be true i'm kind of i might lean a little bit in that direction but i'm but i'm not wedded to that right and my atheism my atheism certainly doesn't depend on that no. okay interesting um <clears throat> let's talk about scientism jp um yeah, scientism. Um, you're not, you're, as you said, you're not anti-science, but you are anti-scientism. So, give us the definition of scientism, and you also talk about weak and strong scientism in your book. Yes, scientism uh, comes in two major forms. One of them is strong scientism, uh, which says that the only way to know truth about reality and have rationally justified beliefs about reality uh, is through the methods of the hard sciences. And so if you can test it uh, and uh, verify it in physics, chemistry, and some of the hard sciences, then you can know it. But if it's not uh, so amenable, then uh, it it is something that uh, you can't know. It may not even be true, but if it is true, no one knows. Uh, weak scientism will allow for um, some level of uh, warrant or justification uh, in certain fields outside the hard sciences, but uh, compared to the hard sciences, uh, they uh, provide a vastly superior form of knowledge than do other fields. And so For example, uh, if psychology begins to return uh, to the uh, idea of a self, a substantial ego that has a libertarian agency, which is a move that's happened in psychology in the last 20 years. Um, If neuroscience says that that that's just not true, uh, and we can explain everything about human functioning Uh, with the brain, then neuroscience is going to trump psychology uh, because it is more wedded to the hard sciences than psychology is. So those are the the two major forms of scientism. And um, I think that uh, neither one of them is true or rational. And uh, that's kind of the thesis of my book. You see, you can see what that if, the, if one of these were true, uh, what that would mean would be that claims in uh, metaphysics or ethics uh, or political assertions um, or uh, theological claims uh, and so on would, would be claims that could, would either not be true or if they were true, nobody would, have, would, would know or have any kind of justified belief about them. And so they would all be relegated to kind of a sort of a postmodern uh, relativist uh, mm. cons- constructivism. <clears throat> and, and, and in your view, I, I assume scientism very often goes hand in hand with naturalism. People who are scien- 
you know believe in in a sense in scientism are are, are very often naturalists who believe that all that ultimately exists is matter in motion and the physical laws of the universe and so on yes i, I think stephen's right that uh, there's so many there's a cottage industry of uh, versions of naturalism so it is hard to come up with uh, one single definition of it that and as stephen pointed out that said, I do think there's a major uh, version of it that, that says uh, it starts with an epistemology, and this epistemology has a, a handful of elements to it, but one of them is a commitment to scientism in one form or the other, and then it has a creation account of how everything that is came to be, it's in general terms, uh, rooted in the atomic theory of matter and evolutionary biology, and then there is an ontology that drops out of that, according to which uh, the, the, uh, the physical universe is all there is. Everything within the physical universe is purely physical. And if there are uh, emergent properties, then they must be determined by and fixed by uh, or supervenient on the physical so I think that would, uh, so the bottom line then is scientism would be uh, a, a component of a naturalist epistemology. Mm. I've titled this show, uh, Is Scientism the New Religion? Slightly tongue in cheek, obviously, Stephen. Um, but I do sometimes feel actually some atheists, for some atheist science, is, is almost regarded with a, a religious kind of fervor. You know, it's the secret to life, the savior of humanity the way, the truth, and the life, or whatever. I mean, what's your view? Do you think this that, that people do get too, too, too ensconced in what science can do for us? Do, do you think that scientism, as JP defines it, does, does exist quite widely in society? Well, as a philosopher, you would expect me to reject scientism. Mm. Um, and, you know, I do. It seems to me that there are questions that science necessarily cannot answer, is not properly equipped to answer, um, and that actually armchair reflection in some cases can answer. Can, can give you knowledge, in a sense. Yeah, so, um, and if you like, we could talk about some examples of that, but, but, but that, that's my view. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't sign up to scientism. I'm aware that there are many different definitions of scientism, um, so some people will define it as uh, the view that, you know, hard sciences provide our only knowledge or our only knowledge of reality, for mm -hmm. example, as JP's just suggested. Um, but then you also find people suggesting that scientism is the view that um, science alone can answer any legitimate question, or if, any th or if, or if the question can be answered at all, mm -hmm. like science will be the right way to answer it. Um, so there are, there are many different ways of characterising it. Um, I personally reject it. I've only ever met one person in my whole life who signs up to the view that science can answer every question, uh, and that who, was that? Professor Peter Atkins. Ah, it's funny you should mention that, and, because uh, I, I had a show with him a I few know, weeks ago, yeah. and, and he very categorically stated that. That's, view. Yeah, yeah, he is really quite exceptional. Um, I've, he's the only person I've ever met that has taken that view, and I, and I, and I, slight, I suspect he, he, slightly that he's... Are you he just, saying that, that even uh, someone else we were, we know well, Richard Dawkins, wouldn't go as far as that Peter Atkins in... in no, well, Dawkins in doesn't go as far as Atkins. Right. Um, I mean, I know that for a fact. So, yeah, so in fact, when I explained what I thought philosophy was to Richard Dawkins as armchair reflection, as conceptual work, mm. um, and that you know considerable progress can be made in that way, he said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he just wants to call it science. So, so, so it turns out that Richard Dawkins has a rather elastic right. conception of science that would actually include, you know, all of all of rational thought, um, whatever we can establish by means of reason. I mean, you do not get... just the scientific yeah. method. So, yeah. so, what do you think of when people like Stephen Hawking, for instance, started their book, The Grand Design, saying philosophy is dead? Um, has he just basically misunderstood what philosophy is? Because in the very next paragraphs, he's doing some philosophy uh, by by defining science and well, the universe and... yeah it's a very that's a very interesting quote and you have to tease out two different things here so one of them is empiricism which is the view that if you want to know about reality the world outside your own mind then you're going to have to use your five senses uh, you're going to have to observe reality that is our only window onto reality um 
that's one view. That's certainly Peter Atkins' view. Um, and that view uh, leads Atkins to say, well, that philosophy is a complete waste of time then, because, you know, sitting in your Which armchair... Which he said. Yeah, <laughs> of course, my show of course he's going ago. to say that, because, <laughs> because, of course, if you're an empiricist... You will think that sitting in your armchair, having a good old think with your eyes closed, right? That's not going to reveal how reality is out mm. there, outside of your own mind. And, and now, so I have some sympathy with empiricism. I kind of lean in that direction a bit, I mm -hmm. have to say. However, I also think that you can establish pretty significant things from the comfort of your armchair, only they're not going to be things about external reality. But they are significant things. Um, so I'll give you an example. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Galileo famously uh, liked a thought experiment, you know, liked to sit in his armchair and have a good old think. And one of the experiments that he did was to test Aristotle's theory about how objects would fall when released. If you, if you drop a, a larger, heavier ball than a lighter ball at the same time from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Aristotle's theories predicted that the two objects would land at different times, that the larger, heavier mm -hmm. object would fall mm -hmm. faster. And Galileo, in his armchair, conjured up the following scenario. Suppose we chain the two balls together. We've now combined them to produce an even heavier mm. object. So the two balls combined should fall even faster than either of the balls did on its own, right? But... In chaining the smaller ball to the heavier ball, you've now chained the ball that fell less quickly to the heavier ball, and so the heavier ball should now fall a bit slower <laughs> than it did yes. before. The little ball should yeah. go behind and mm. act as a brake. Mm. So by helping ourselves to a few fairly innocuous assumptions, we can derive from Aristotle's theory a logical contradiction. The two balls combined fall faster and slower than they do individually. And a logical contradiction cannot be true, so Aristotle's theory is false. That was a work of genius, that little thought experiment, and it works. It does establish that a certain description mm. of reality, namely Aristotle's, cannot be true because it contains a logical contradiction. However, and this is the punchline, mm -hmm. right? However, that's not to say that we yet know what is going to happen to the two balls when you drop them off the top of the <laughs> Leaning Tower piece. You don't until you go and have a look. Yeah, sure. Right? So, there's, so that's philosophical or conceptual work, mm. armchair work. We can do, we can, we've made great leaps forward there, right? And we've certainly discovered how reality isn't, because a certain description of it contains, mm. involves a contradiction. Mm. But that's not to say that we yet know how reality is. And it seems to me that actually the, the, to think of philosophy as a sort of grand metaphysical project of revealing how reality truly is, I think that probably is a grand waste that, of time. That's but an that's overreach. Not, but that's, that's right. not to say that philosophy okay. is a grand waste of time. I mean, we've just, we just refuted <laughs> Aristotle's theory, haven't we, from the comfort of our armchairs. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I hold... Uh, the, a different view. I hold uh, that metaphysics, for example, uh, is a, a way of knowing reality. And um, I, I think that the sort of thing that um, Stephen is talking about is that uh, philosophy is involved in conceptual analysis. And uh, it is it, it does a great job at um, bringing order and analyzing and clarifying the, uh, our concepts about reality. Uh, but then what we need to do is to go and test those against reality unless we are able to generate a, a, a contradiction. Now that, I don't know if that's Stephen's view, but that certainly has <clears throat> been a major view in philosophy since what's called the linguistic turn, where philosopher, this traces all the way back to Descartes, uh, with what was called his idea theory. But um, I, I don't know if, if that's uh, the general framework Stephen's uh, working in, but, uh, and, and you can comment to that, Stephen, but I mm -hmm. think that we have uh, uh, direct access to reality, and I think a priori knowledge uh, is, uh, of, of mathematics and logic and metaphysics uh, is actually... Uh, uh, a, a power of intuition and awareness uh, yeah. into the realm of abstract objects and their relations. Yeah. So, so and this is where this is the classic debate about empiricism. Then, okay. So, so if if you're an empiricist, you think that your five senses provide you with your only window onto reality, and so by sitting sitting in your armchair with your eyes closed and your fingers in your ears, you're not going to find out anything about reality. Whereas 
Um, the rationalists uh, think that you know, there's at least one thing that you can know, a substantive thing about the world out there outside of your own mind that you can know purely by means of reflection. Um, and, you know, the, possibly that's true. The, the, the problem that you then run into is that you need to give an account of how we could arrive at that knowledge. By what mechanism is this knowledge of external reality delivered to us, if not via the usual window of the five senses. And, and the word intuition immediately crops up at that point. So if you're a mathematical realist and you think that maths is out there in some kind of platonic mathematical reality, then how do you find out about that reality? Mathematical intuition. If you believe that there are moral facts out there in some kind of moral reality, how do you find out about that reality? Moral intuition. If there are modal facts, facts yeah. about necessity and so on out there, logical facts, how do you find out about them? Some kind of logical okay. intuition. Okay. So, so, so you're, you're wary of the word intuition. Basically. So, yeah, so it's, it, it's a word that... Um, stands in for you know it's basically it's a question mark i mean how the hell does that work we have okay. no idea which is one of the main reasons why people tend to drift towards empiricism what, what's your response to that jp well i think uh i think it's just false that uh before you can know something you have to be able to tell how you know it or provide a mechanism for that in fact no, that I didn't is say that, though. <laughs> um that's just not true you can yes. know things without knowing how you know them, and then you can build yes, up criteria for knowledge subsequently. Yeah, I This agree is with a that. view in epistemology known as a, a particularism. I think that the idea that you have to know some mechanism is, is completely question-begging, because I think there may be, I'm not even, I don't even know that there's a, a mechanism that is involved in sense experience. I, I highly doubt it. But um, the word intuition uh, is not just a placeholder for I know not what. Uh, uh, Edmund Husserl, uh, in the logical investigations, did a very precise unpacking of what he called eidetic intuition. And uh, there were some uh, examples that he gave where you could know when you were experiencing an awareness of an abstract object. And so um, the, what, what I would say is that we have all, all kinds of knowledge by acquaintance, that is the power to be directly aware of things that are not sense perceptible. For example, I'm able to be aware of my own states of consciousness. I'm able to be aware of which sense organs are mine. I don't do that by empiricism empirical techniques. And I think that uh, some of the foundational uh, laws of metaphysics and of logic and mathematics, modal logic, um, and, and certain moral facts are themselves known by a, a, a power of being able to be aware of value or of uh, mathematical entities and so on. Now, Let, let's, um, let's just go to a quick break here because we, we're just butting up against our first break. And I want to come back to you, JP, because I do want to explore this more, this idea that there are certain things, logic, maths, a priori aspects of reality, which science needs to assume in order for us to do science. And therefore, um, science cannot explain everything because there, there are these foundations, as it were, that are needed before you even get to do science. Um, so so I, I want to unpack that and, and then see what Stephen has to say in response. Um, fascinating show today, philosophical one, asking, is scientism the new religion? Uh, based off the, the latest book by uh, one of our guests, J.P. Moreland, Scientism and Secularism, Learning to Respond to a Dangerous Ideology. J.P. is a Christian. Stephen Law is a humanist philosopher who's in conversation with him today and we'll be back in a short moment's time if you listen to unbelievable with justin briley on premier christian radio and enjoy the conversations between christians and skeptics then this is the perfect app for you for the latest updates podcasts videos articles bonus content and much more download the premier unbelievable app today You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. 
Welcome back to the programme, asking, is scientism the new religion on Unbelievable Today? Joined by Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland and atheist philosopher Stephen Law. And talking about J.P.'s new book, Scientism and Secularism. And by the way, again, J.P. will be with us for Unbelievable the Conference, Saturday the 20th of July. Book your ticket now uh, for central London. Um, But um, we were kind of talking about scientism. We defined that and talked a little bit about that in the first part of the show, J.P., and one of the, I think the fascinating things in the book is um, is the fact that that you kind of talk about various aspects of reality which are themselves assumed in order to do science, and therefore it's difficult to see how you could say that science it, itself is uh, explains these particular phenomena. And so, for instance, some of them include um, the phenomenon of, of logic and maths, and um, some of those other things that you, you've been referring to there uh, in, in that last section. Do you want to just unpack that a little bit and explain why yeah. these things yes. need to be assumed and have a different, are in a kind of different category to the kind of things that science can explain for us and unpack for us? Uh, yes, I would say that they are assumptions relative to science, uh, but not relative to philosophy, because I think philosophy is the field that clarifies these uh, claims and provides justification for them or criticisms of them. For, and, and for example, uh, that there is such a thing as truth, and what exactly is its nature? Is it a correspondence with reality? Um, uh, the the, the uh, uh, knowledge of normativity, uh, uh, for example, uh, what is a good explanation and what is a bad one? What kind of epistemic virtues do, do, do good theories uh, exemplify? Um, uh, things like the laws of logic and, and mathematics. I would say certain moral knowledge. Uh, report your test results honestly and, uh, b- and be fair with the data uh, and things of that sort. Uh, the, the value of epistemic simplicity um, the, these are things that are, uh, I think, uh, strictly philosophical, but yet they're, they're all, I think, uh, presuppositions relative to science, especially if we're going to take science in some kind of a realist sort of way. So that's, that's a claim that I make, and then I make a claim that there's, there are things outside of science that we know with as much or greater certainty than some of the things that we know in in the hard sciences. And and so when it comes to things like the kind of laws of logic, which need to be there in place, as it were, before you can then go and, you know, test things and make hypotheses and, and see if things are true. Um, if those are not, as it were, <laughs> there, if those have to be in place before you can do science, um, does that for you fall into the realm of, of being philo- something we explore through philosophy then? And I suppose to take it a step further, um, does that in any way then give us grounds for saying, well, here's something which uh, leads us into the realm of the supernatural, something that is can't be explained on, in purely naturalistic terms? Because I know there is a whole realm of uh, theology and apologetics which does see that these sort of so-called, you know, transcendent things have some kind of, uh, you know, transcendent uh, source in, in, in God. Well, I, yes, I would, uh, I've not made that claim yet, but I do believe that these uh, are, these kinds of issues fall properly within the purview of, of philosophical methodology, and logic is one of those. And when you do a proof <clears throat> in logic, uh, you rely on intuition. And it's very interesting. I think Polanyi called this tacit knowledge, but skilled practitioners are able to uh, hold more lines of a proof together in their uh, uh, intellectual gaze, as I I would put it, and they're able to see, and that's not empirical, uh, they're able to see that the one line actually follows from a line several lines up, whereas a novice uh, is going to be able to have that kind of intuitive experience uh, between maybe two lines, but it, it's, and it's the sort of thing where you can develop your mental ability to, quote, perceive intuitively um, the laws of logic themselves and how they relate propositions. And so, yes, I would take 
Now, the, now that, that our faculties are able to do that, I don't think um, there is a good atheistic explanation for that, but I think there is a very good theistic explanation for it. Okay, well, maybe we'll, we'll come to that in due course. But let, comment on what, what JP said so far there, Stephen, in terms of his view that um, there are these assumptions that we need to get going before we can test things empirically and scientifically and, and that kind of thing. Uh, these intuitions, he says, and they're, and it's not, you know, he has no problem with the idea of intuition. We do know things in a direct fashion, even if we can't give a, a mechanistic explanation for them. Sure. Well, without um, looking at the specific examples um, that um, JP's just outlined, we're on the same page, obviously, okay. about about scientism. We're of the view that science can't answer every legitimate question. Um, and what this book does um, is it suggests that scientism is kind of all-pervasive um, it, it constitutes the intellectual and cultural air we breathe, um, mm. I think it says on page 26. And um, I'm not so sure about that. As I say, Peter Atkins is the only person I've ever met that actually is Take, pre- was prepared, that far, was prepared right. to say that actually science can answer, answer every legitimate question. That's the only person I've ever come across that takes that view. Um, it use, here's, here's an analogy uh, which may help illuminate what I think is going on. Uh, not so many years ago, it was very common, particularly in the United States of America, if you were to express a sort of vaguely left-leaning view, perhaps that taxes should increase or something mm-hmm. like that, you would almost certainly and immediately be accused in a kind of a knee-jerk way of being a communist. Right? Um, any you know vaguely left-wing view was immediately seen to be a uh, communist and it would be dismissed as a communist view and everyone knows that communism is just dangerous nonsense and so we can just put that out of our minds straight away. It was a very, very convenient way of shutting down debates and stuffing socks into the mouths of people that might be asking awkward questions or making difficult points. Um, and it seems to me that something similar is now going on with the word scientism. Very few people actually do sign up to scientism. It is not the pervasive thing that it's often presented as being. Um, And it seems to me that very often people read into comments that people make. They read into it, scientism. Whereas if you actually look more carefully at what people are saying, it's not actually scientism after all. So looking at the book that JP has written, which is a very interesting book, he starts out by providing three examples of scientism to illustrate just how all-encompassing and pervasive it really is. And I looked at all three examples and I thought, this isn't scientism. Give, give us the examples you, that you, 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 and then we'll have JP respond. Sure. Yeah, so one, one the, the last of the three was, um, was a quote from um, a State of California documents concerning public schools which said that when scientific conclusions contradict a pupil's religious belief, you know, perhaps the the, the scientific conclusion is that the universe is older than 6,000 years, say, or whatever it might happen to be, um, pupils should be told that while they may have reservations, that nevertheless that is the scientific consensus. Is that scientism, do you think, Justin? Well, JP, what do you say? Is that what you intended to to say there? uh, The quote goes, goes much further. Uh, then um, Steve, uh, Stephen has read, which is fine. Um, but it goes on <clears throat> to say that um, uh, the claims of science uh, in that quote, uh, which sets policy for the state of California public schools, um, uh, describes the claims of science in deeply cognitive terms. They're facts about which no one in science disputes um, they are part of our intellectual heritage. They're, Sorry, is this, they're, in the, is, is this in the quotation on page 28 of your book? Because I'm looking at I, it. I don't have the well, book. Well, let, let, me, let me quote what you did quote from, <clears throat> from, the, from this particular um, 
uh, guidance that was issued. Um, you say, uh, it says here, the document offered teachers advice about how to address students who expressed reservations about the theory of biological macroevolution. And here's the quote. At times, some students may insist that certain conclusions of science cannot be true because of certain religious or philosophical beliefs they hold. It is appropriate for the teacher to express in this regard. I understand that you may have personal reservations about accepting this scientific evidence, but it is scientific knowledge about which there is no reasonable doubt among scientists in their field. And it is my responsibility to teach it because it because it is part of our common intellectual heritage so so yes okay. so, yeah, so, so, so what so i do is i f- i fix on other words used to describe scientific claims conclusions evidence knowledge no reasonable doubt intellectual heritage and then the words that are used to describe philosophical or religious claims are personal reservations and beliefs i see now i know what stands behind that and i can oh. give an ex- illustration of scientism at work here but what this actually means is that the claims of science have authority to to guide us uh in our pursuit of education and knowledge but the claims of religion and philosophy are private and personal now that's scientism uh that that is a that presupposes and is rooted in a view of scientific knowledge as being either vastly superior or perhaps the only way of knowing relative to, say, philosophical or religious claims. Okay, so so we understand that you're saying that, that it's it's the message behind the the, right. the the statement there is essentially science is the authority and religious and philosophical right. concerns take a back seat to science when it comes to uh, yes. th- these kinds of things. yes. Yeah, so, so okay. So Stephen, well, that's your reading. I mean, if you actually look what it says, it just says, look, this is the scientific consensus. This is what scientific scientists believe. And it's perfectly reasonable for teachers to be able to say that in the classroom. And it, it, it in no way does that suggest or commit this person to saying that there aren't other ways of knowing about things or that people don't make mistakes and so on. This is not a commitment to scientism. It's being read as that because, presumably because JP doesn't like it very much. So he's reading the science into it. And he does this not just in this occasion, but on another of, uh, in, the, in the two other examples also. So, for example... Um, he has uh, Michael Kinsley um, says something about embryo cells. He says there's nothing human about them, which is highly contentious, of course. And he also adds, and except if you choose to believe it, a soul. Maybe that maybe there's a soul. He says if you choose to believe and, and that. And the language he uses is except if you choose to believe it. Except yeah. if you now now why would he say that? Because he doesn't believe in souls personally. If you don't believe in the soul, you can't say well you could know that somebody has a human soul because you can't know what isn't true. So clearly this person is sceptical about the existence of souls. That's not scientism. And to say, to jump to the conclusion that the reason he says you can't know people have souls, right, to jump to the conclusion that he says that because of scientism is clearly a highly uncharitable reading when the much more obvious explanation is he simply doesn't believe in them. OK, let, let me just give the, the full quote for context here and then have you respond, JP. Uh, so this is, a, again, th- this is in a, sec- a section that you title Scientism Illustrated. And you give this example on June 25th, 2001. Time magazine featured an article by journalist Michael Kinsley defending stem cell research on human embryos. He wrote, these embryos are microscopic groupings of a few differentiated cells. There is nothing human about them except potential and if you choose to believe it, a soul. So again, give give us your your view, uh, JP, on why that does count as an example of scientism being illustrated in in the public sphere. Well, there are two claims that are uh, being uh, considered in his statement. One of them is a biological claim that he takes there to be uh, an established fact. It's something that we know, uh, and there's just no controversy about it. Uh, the 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 other one is, as Stephen has pointed out, it's the claim that um, if you choose to believe it, uh, uh, there's a soul. Now, the, the point here is not that he doesn't believe in a soul, and, and thus uh, he's going to say, well, if you believe in that sort of thing. 
the, the issue is why he doesn't believe in a soul. And um, <clears throat> I think it's because uh, in that in the passage itself, souls are the sorts of things that you have to simply choose to believe or not believe. And what that means is, is that there's not there, that there's not a proof in one way or the <clears throat> other. And so the reason he doesn't believe in it is because there's no evidence for souls. And he, he so he's chosen not to. So I am I take this to be an example of where he's relegating a sort of a metaphysical or even a theological claim uh, to the realm of choosing to believe. Uh, that's the cognitive status of so, claims so, yeah. like that. So, so uh, as I understand it, JP, you're you're taking examples from popular culture and saying here's where yes. the underlying assumptions are essentially scientific scientism. Um, yes, that's though, what, exactly though obviously what I'm doing. you feel that that, that JP is being a little bit creative in in his quite the way quite creative i mean that. if i was writing a book about scientism and i wanted to show that it was all pervasive and the intellectual and cultural air we breathe then surely i wouldn't have any problem whatsoever finding several clear-cut examples of scientism being espoused but instead we get three examples all of which don't even look to me like scientism i can see how you might want to put a scientific gloss on them but there's no clear commitment to scientism in them and that should make a red light come on surely at this point if the author of the book can't even come up with clear concrete irrefutable examples of scientism that may suggest that it's being exaggerated a well, bit like communism used well, to be let, let me let you respond jp why do you feel you're not exaggerating <coughs> the, the 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 way in which scientism in your view is very widespread and 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 so on well uh, i make the point in the book that scientism is uh in the drinking water that means that it's pervasive throughout culture I've lectured on 200 college campuses, and I have uh, been around, and I have confronted people who hold the scientism all the time. It also fills the literature on philosophy of mind and philosophical naturalism, uh, debates about naturalism. So the literature is filled with scientism. But why didn't you actually use uh, some examples? Let, let me. <laughs> let, I'm sorry. Let me just finish this, okay. and I'll give it back. Um, so I, I am picking examples where the scientism is, is not clearly stated, but implicit. And it's obvious that it's in the drinking water because that is what is being assumed by the statements being made. And so I'm trying to illustrate how pervasive uh, scientism is even though people don't know what it is and don't know how to articulate it, it is what is underlying their view of various subjects. And so I think that I'm not adding a gloss to these. I am actually surfacing what is being presupposed uh, by, the, by the explicit claims being made in these examples. If, and... Uh, if, yes, if, if I could maybe just just to move us along a bit in the conversation here, um, I, I admittedly you don't very often find people who who state it as explicitly as a Peter Atkins, let's say Stephen. But mm. I've had other shows with Lawrence Krauss. He said very similar things about um, the why questions are pointless questions. They're silly questions. The only questions worth asking oh, yeah, there are, are some the, there there are... There's, there's there's plenty of that around. I think, and and yeah. I and I do run into plenty of people. I think who basically believe in the, maybe the weak scientism that, that JP's outlined, that ultimately it's, all questions do ultimately have a kind of naturalistic kind of hard science result. So whether it's history, psychology, whatever, it's all going to ultimately come down to the, the movements of molecules is, is, is sort of what it will ultimately be explained by, even if there are kind of phenomena that sort of sit above that, that that are you know emergent as as a daniel dennett might put it yeah from, I, from I, those I, things. I, I certainly didn't want don't want to deny i mean just as you know there certainly were communists around right in the united <laughs> states when, when everyone saw communism everywhere there certainly were some communists but it was hugely exaggerated okay. and inflated so similarly there are people that are guilty of scientism or something close to it uh, now and there, there is sometimes a sort of a, a, a too much respect slightly too much respect given to science and you know it, there, there are exaggerations made sure. and so on so I, I don't want to deny that but what i what does concern me 
is the way in which arguments and claims may be shut down by the use of this term, scientism. The, the finger comes out and it, it's pointed at you. You're guilty of scientism. So now I don't really have to take your views seriously anymore. Um, this is the most common way in which the term is used in the culture now. So, for example, you know, public enemy number one, Richard Dawkins, right? <laughs> the minute he opens his mouth, you can be sure somebody's going to point a finger at him and say, you, Richard Dawkins, should remember that there are more things in heaven, hell, than a dreamt of in your <laughs> philosophy. Show a, little, show a little modesty and humility. Acknowledge that, you know, there are other ways of knowing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the, the truth is that actually if you look at what he's saying... Um, it, it doesn't rely on scientism at all, insofar as in The God Delusion, for example, he presents what he thinks is, I mean, I'm not so sure, but what he thinks is a scientific argument to show that there's probably no God, right. right? for example. That is not actually scientism. And in fact, this is what I would be particularly keen to discuss now with JP. I mean, do, do you, JP, think that science is capable of showing perhaps that they're probably is a god or that there probably isn't a god what do you think yes i think scientific claims of certain kinds can lend support to theism the big bang and the second law i think have, have been helpful in establishing that there was a beginning to the universe i think the philosophical arguments for a beginning are even more uh, powerful than the scientific ones. I think that so, I think 95% of science is completely irrelevant to Christianity or God or what. I don't care mm -hmm. if a methane molecule has four hydrogens or 15. Yeah. As a as a Christian thinker, I think the other five percent. There's been about three percent uh, that's been in favor of the existence of God, and I would say two percent have counted against largely the early chapters of Genesis. I don't think there are many scientific uh, uh, claims uh, that can be used to count against uh, God's existence, but I don't say that in principle that there couldn't be something uh, uh, okay, so, that so would Dawkins, do that. So it would be a mistake then to accuse Richard Dawkins of scientism if he thinks that in principle science might be able to come up with grounds for thinking that there's probably no God. It would be a mistake to accuse Richard Dawkins of scientism for supposing that. Uh, absolutely, it would be a mistake. That's now, some concession. Dawkins, <laughs> because we've had lots of other people surely on this show like Galliston McGrath and so on pointing a finger at Richard Dawkins and saying you are guilty of scientism, Richard. And But you, JP, are saying no, he's not insofar as he's committed. No, 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 I did not say that. I said that if, if from the fact that he's making the claim uh, that there are there are certain scientific evidence that makes the existence of God uh, improbable, uh, that it, that itself is not an example of scientism. Yeah, good. Now that doesn't mean he doesn't hold the scientism. That sure, would have sure. to be settled by things that he has said <clears throat> elsewhere yeah. or kind of his oh, general Agreed. Uh, yeah. hmm. at dismissive but attitude be, toward But this is important. Right? This is a, let's just get completely clear about this then. So, so anyone who accuses Richard Dawkins of scientism purely on the grounds that he thinks that science might in principle come up with grounds for thinking that there's probably no God... Anyone that makes that accusation is making a mistake, and he's not guilty for the, on that basis. That's right. Good. Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that 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 was in a point of agreement. The, mm. the, the, I suppose the thing that I think we probably need to get towards before the show runs out of time is kind of where this all takes us. Because there's been measures of agreement between you both. You, you both agree that a, a hard scientism is certainly wrong. I think then Stephen says, but I'm I do appreciate the empirical method, and perhaps you give that more weight than jp does who who think feels that there is there's a lot that we can know in a kind of direct intuitive way that mm. isn't necessarily open to it the empirical method and so the, on the reason i introduced empiricism is because it often gets muddled up with scientism right and 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 in fact empiricism's got a bit more going for it you know okay. and so and i can and, and i can see why if you're peter atkins for example and you're wedded to empiricism that would then lead you to think that 
philosophy must be a waste of time because how could you find out anything about the world outside your own mind by sitting in your armchair and having a good old think about it? And I have some sympathy with that view. It's just that I think that philosophy can reveal important truths and provide important insights despite the fact that it doesn't do that. But but I think where you're going to disagree, and perhaps this is where we'll go just in our final section next, is is on the implications of the the parts of uh, those aspects of knowledge that don't necessarily come to us through science. And so I would like to talk about whether logic, math, reason, and even other things you cover in some depth in the book, JP, like um, the experience of consciousness and other things, um, not that we'll have a lot of time to go into them, are, do actually point um, to something other than a naturalistic kind of explanation for them. That, that um, That's obviously where you land up in the book. Um, so we're going to um, go to another quick break and we'll come back with my guests today, two philosophers, one a Christian, one an atheist, JP Moreland and Stephen Law. We're debating is scientism the new religion. Believers and non-believers will all be helped, says Tim Keller, a wonderfully clear and accessible case for Christianity from a man who has hosted many of the world's most prominent skeptics and atheists, says Andrew Wilson. Beautifully written, brilliantly argued, will thrill and challenge, says R.T. Kendall. Unbelievable the book by Justin Briley. Download a free chapter and find out how it can help you make the case for Christ. Unbelievablebook.co.uk Welcome back to the final part of this week's edition of Unbelievable, and we'll continue the conversation between J.P. Moreland and Stephen Law very shortly. Uh, A reminder, though, that J.P. Moreland, one of our fantastic speakers at this year's Unbelievable Conference, Saturday the 20th of July in central London. It's at Westminster Central Hall, uh, a great venue. We were there back in 2014, and we're back for 2019 now. Uh, We're inviting you to join the revolution and speak truth in a post-truth world. That's our conference theme this year in partnership with Biola Apologetics and ADF International, uh, a day to equip you to share the truth of Christianity in a world of fake news, all about better conversations, responding to different worldviews, being a confident Christian in the world today. Uh, As I say, JP Moreland and Craig Hazen from Biola, loads of other speakers as well, Paul Coleman and Andy Tonhauser of ADF International. Uh, We've got Krish Kandaya there, Sarah Lumger there, Bruxy Cavey's coming over from Canada, We've got Ruth Jackson and Emily Howarth and more to be announced. I've got some exciting people uh, to be confirmed very shortly. Uh, but uh, it's all there on the website if you want to check it out so far, the lineup, the theme. And book it for cheap early bird ticket prices now. Uh, that's the thing to do. PremierChristianRadio.com slash Unbelievable Conference. Uh, student and group discounts also available there. Book now and join the revolution. And uh, you'll be hearing more about it in the course of uh, the coming months as well, of course, as we uh, feature some of the speakers and topics that we'll be discussing at the conference. But uh, all of you early birders, get in there now. I know a lot of you have been waiting, standing by for us to release the ticketing. And uh, now is your opportunity uh, from from the Unbelievable webpage or equally at the site there, premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable conference i'll be uh, looking through some of your feedback to the show a little bit later on in the program but straight after unbelievable uh, here on premier christian radio on the profile it's tim jupp former delirious band member and now the main man behind one of the uk's biggest christian music festivals the big church day out he'll be talking to sam hales about his faith and life also available on its own profile podcast next week here on unbelievable the cessationist and the charismatic they'll be debating tongues prophecy and the gifts of the spirit are they for today as i'm joined by andrew wilson and simon arscott andrew is our charismatic in that debate and he's got a new book out uh, on that subject spirit and sacrament it's called an invitation to you charismatic worship Uh, so look forward to that at the same time next week right now let's get back into the final part of today's conversation you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio Welcome back to the final part of this week's edition of the show. So excited to have been joined on the show today by J.P. Moreland and Stephen Law, both philosophers. One's a Christian, one's an atheist. Uh, J.P.'s new book, Scientism and Secularism, is out now, uh, published by Crossway. I'll make sure there are links to that from today's edition of the show. Plus, of course, Stephen Law has plenty of books to his name. uh, And I'll make sure there are links from today's program to his website as well, where you can find out more about them. Um, We've been asking, is scientism the new religion on the basis of this book by UJP? Um, We've obviously done some debate about defining scientism and uh, all the examples you cite, scientism valid and so on. Ultimately, though, it strikes me that you're, you as much have naturalism in your sights as scientism in this uh, in this book because 
essentially as you've said they kind of go hand in hand very often people who do appear to have scientific type beliefs uh, are often making the assumption that all that exists in the universe is matter and energy and you know the laws of nature um, and for you lots of the things that we have to make assumptions about and have direct experience of like consciousness uh, laws of logic maths uh, moral knowledge and so on um, themselves seem to point away from naturalism and towards theism towards um, a supernatural source so do you want to speak to that albeit briefly now and, and we'll see what Stephen has to say in response well there, there is a uh, a bevy of arguments that I believe are, are successful in making it more reasonable to believe in a personal uh, God than uh, to be agnostic about that or not to believe it and um, these arguments, some of them uh, appropriate empirical data from science, like the discovery of fine tuning uh, uh, and so on. But some of them uh, don't don't involve that. Uh, for an example would be uh, the origin of consciousness. Uh, there just is no strict naturalist explanation of the origin of consciousness. And by a strict naturalist, I mean someone who would be a, a physicalist without uh, there being such things as emergent properties. Uh, uh, so so I, I claim that consciousness, uh, if you say in the beginning were the particles, and the history of the universe is the history of the rearrangement of those into more and more structurally complex geometrical arrangements and then at some point presto uh, a, a conscious state appears uh that's a, that's uh like getting something from nothing uh it uh if matter is the way as david papineau po points out in his book philosophical naturalism uh if it's if it's the way that 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 physics and chemistry tell us it is with reasonable projections toward the future. One thing we know is that the future physics and chemistry is not going to contain mental categories. And so thought, belief, sensation, and so on just isn't going to be a part of that framework. And so if you have in the beginning was the logos, then your fundamental entity is conscious and you don't have any difficulty with, with there being subsequent beings who exemplify mental properties. Um, uh, this has been, uh, um, uh, David Chalmers has acknowledged that this is true. And so what he has done is moved to panpsychism. He calls it proto-panpsychism. And, and it's a certain uh, specific version of it. But um, I don't think that you can explain the origin of macro consciousness from micro uh, panpsychism of any version for two reasons, and then I'll quit. Mm. The first one is that it's it's clear uh, that conscious states and physical states are contingently connected. There are all kinds of thought experiments that are clearly conceivable. And in this case, I think their being conceivable is a good guide to their possibility. And that would be a situation where uh, the same brain state could be correlated with an appearance of red or an appearance of blue. Um, there's no necessary connection here. Uh, the second problem is that if all the fundamental entities at the microphysical level have an attenuated form of consciousness and they come together to give rise to say my consciousness you have the combination problem it's hard to know how you could get a uh, unified consciousness like i possess simply by the concatenation of uh, billions of little particles or or other entities that have attenuated consciousness. And Chalmers says that the combination problem, the problem of getting a unity of consciousness from little bits of consciousness has never been solved. And it won't be solved. And I think that uh, the existence of consciousness uh, through a Bayesian um, approach or through just an inference to the best explanation is best explained by the existence of a conscious theistic God. 
rather than starting with matter and trying to figure out how you get consciousness. Okay, so that was a super brief explanation of, of, a, of a very big topic, obviously, um, which you've written about at much greater yeah. length elsewhere, JP. <laughs> yeah. um, and at the risk of this turning into a, a, a str- debate that's far too short on, on consciousness, um, I suppose the point is that for someone like JP, Stephen, um, consciousness is not the kind of phenomenon that lends itself to simply scientists, scientists, science answer simply from science looking at what happens to molecules in motion and that kind of thing um and and to go further than that he doesn't think it coheres well with an atheist or naturalist view of reality he says that it it seems to fit much better with the view that there is a a consciousness out there there's a transcendent type of consciousness within which this consciousness sort of finds itself so yeah Hmm. where do you want to go Golly, what a <laughs> massive can of rum that. <laughs> that one is. Um, well, you know, like I said right at the beginning of this program, I'm, I'm not wedded to naturalism. I mean, you know, I, 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 I lean a little bit in that direction, but if it turns out that there are more facts than the natural you, facts, it's not. Is there any label you are willing to, to, to wear, or are you agnostic on, on all of these fronts? Um, no, I'm quite happy with atheist. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm definitely an atheist. I'm not particularly, no, I'm not particularly uh, wedded to naturalism. There are famously um, problems for empiricism when it comes to maths and morals and minds and modals, as they're known. Mm-hmm. You know, necessary truth. What's the nature of that? Is it embedded in the world or merely a product of our mm. conceptual schemes? Say, eh? so the, there are problems for how we could get to know about this kind of moral or modal reality if it's out there, mind independently. Um, empiricists say mm. so it's not out there mind independently because it, <laughs> because otherwise we wouldn't be able to get to know about it um, and then naturalism also struggles traditionally with these kinds of facts how do you accommodate them within a, a purely mm. naturalistic framework and some people think it can be done and some people think it can't be done um, what uh, theists do is they hijack this whole traditional philosophical mm. debate right and say oh look there's loads of things you can't explain or you're not sure about there we've got that covered uh, God God did it uh, kind of it's a basic it is a, it's the good old God of the gaps well now you are um, sounding like Peter Atkins who <laughs> basically said the same thing yeah <laughs> it's like it's like this you know we're, we're sitting in my front room and I'm I, I, I think to myself hang on my keys I put them on the sofa and now they're on the mantelpiece and and why is the tap has the tap started to drip I don't know the explanation for that uh, and you say Stephen I've got it covered there's a conscious being in your room it's a gremlin and it moved your keys it has the power to move them around it it desires that kind of thing it desires to confuse us and it likes to cause mischief and, t- and, and, and start taps by invoking a hidden super being with magical powers you can explain anything immediately which is why humans have always okay. done it when we couldn't explain why the planets moved they were gods when we couldn't explain why the plants grew they were nature spirits and so on it is the traditional default explanation to offer and it and it will immediately so, explain so whatever you need but is it is it the best explanation gremlins right, okay. really i rather doubt so, it so, worse still <laughs> okay we've got really good evidence against gremlins and we've got really good evidence against the existence of well, the judeo-christian I, God. I was going to say <laughs> when when we covered this in that debate as i say several years ago now with william lane craig you did say yeah i think on balance i do believe in objective moral values but if that means god exists then i will rather reject my object view belief in objective moral values than than no, concede that's god. A, well, that's you a, said something along these lines was, yeah that's because because you gloss. think the the evidence for god is <clears throat> is not there or you, i do you're think so so, so jp has been happy to acknowledge that you could have you know richard dawkins could potentially cook up a science or observation based argument that would show that there's probably no god now Actually, you don't need science, you just need empirical observation. There is abundant evidence uh, that actually, if there is any kind of consciousness behind the universe, it's not supremely powerful and all good and loving and benevolent. Just look at childhood mortality rates over the 200,000-year history of human beings. Most children never made it past the age of five. They suffered horribly, their parents suffered horribly. You know, and that's just one example. The, the world is filled with horror and pain which is well, very good evidence, I'm going to suggest, against 
the existence of God, even if, even if we could show that there was some yeah. kind of consciousness behind well, it. Well, now we are opening up another huge can of worms. But th- let's come back to you, JP, because, I mean, to, just to go back to Stephen's original point, essentially he's yeah. saying, OK, uh, there are mysteries and naturalism doesn't seem to fit very well with all of them, granted. But invoking God is basically God of the gaps, um, doing what they used to do when they wanted an explanation for the rain or the movements of the planets. So what, why for you are these particular examples you bring in the book not that kind of um, God of right. the gap kind of uh, philosophy? Well, well, two things. I mean, first of all, I think it is, with all due respect, I think it's absurd uh, to paint a brush of God of the gaps over the history of natural theology. That is one of the richest uh, intellectual histories of any subject that's ever been investigated. And the arguments for God's existence are not examples of God of the gap arguments. They're, they're uh, attempts to explain certain facts uh, that uh, a theistic being makes uh, removes our puzzlement about them and satisfies uh, various criteria of a good explanation. Um, uh, so that's that's number one. Uh, I th- so I think that, that that most of these arguments, including the argument from consciousness, is not a God of the gaps argument. It's a, it's a, a, a different sort of argument. Uh, the second thing I would say would be that I think maybe Stephen could comment on this, but I think he's using his uh, view that uh, cognitive science has kind of demonstrated that we're inclined to project agency onto the world and see these uh, be- and see beings everywhere uh, and uh, that this is nothing but just projection. And I just want to say a couple of things about that. I mean, number one, the biblical God is not the sort of God anybody would want to project. Uh, 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 project a trinity, project some being that is completely sovereign, and uh, omniscient and makes demands on us. Uh, the, the biblical God is not anywhere near the collective uh, subconscious or behavior of Israel or the apostles. I think the second thing I would say would be that there are, is a clear class of experiences that survive uh, this projection thesis. The, uh, these would be religious experiences like specific answers to prayer, a divine healing, uh, a, a, a group of people seeing the same angels at the same time and describing them identically, of which there is, uh, in the first two cases, empirically verifiable uh, evidence that, that God answered this prayer. Um, and uh, so, for example, there was a Jewish woman that came to our prayer room years ago and she had 31 points of cancer in her life and was in hospice. And uh, she was prayed over for two nights. And the third night she was prayed over, she felt something move in her body. And she went to her doctor and the cancer was completely gone. Nothing was there. There have also been blind people that have been healed. There are people who have had growth in uh, and healing in, in cracks in their bones instantaneously that is medically documented. And so there are all kinds of, uh, not to mention the resurrection of the biblical miracles for which there's historical evidence. So I think that the, uh, in summary, that this uh, projection thesis, um, uh, even if it covers certain religious experiences. And that would explain, by the way, why there's diversity. So many people just project their culture. Uh, uh, Christianity doesn't. Uh, but but there is a class of, merit of religious experiences that do not fall under that category because they have empirically testable uh, implications and would be satisfy the requirements of testimony in a court of law. We we are going to have to start drawing things to a close here, and there's so many more directions we could go in from here. I'm, I'm sure a hundred things in that <laughs> that you want to respond to, Stephen. Um, <laughs> yeah. What if I could ask you though to start mm-hmm. to draw things to a close? What any final thoughts as we begin to uh, to sum up today's show? Start with you, Stephen. Um, 
Oh dear, I wasn't expecting to answer, have to answer my question. <laughs> um, or, or, well, you answer <laughs> the question you want to answer at this point, then, and, we'll, and I'll I'll draw things to a close instead. Um, well, I would, I would. Um, well, let me just briefly respond right. to what JP just said. Go so, on. so um, I, th- I find. I mean, personally, I find. I mean, the suggestion was that we people wouldn't want to believe in God. Really? <laughs> I mean, every now and then I get an email coming to my um, mailbox that says, if you pass this message on, you will receive good luck. And if you don't, you're going to have very bad luck. And of course, it, this is very effective. A lot of people will pass it on. It's how those messages get spread around the internet very, very quickly. Now, that, that's a pretty potent carrot and stick combination. Eternal life or hell, eternal damnation, there is no conceivably greater carrot and stick combination. That is... Stephen, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen I, that, I just to correct you, I did not say that people don't want to believe in God. I, that's not my claim. Oh, okay. uh, my claim was that nobody uh, would come up with the biblical God uh, if they were projecting. They would come up with a much tamer God that allowed them to do various things. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you if you actually look at various different religions and the very strange claims that they come up with, it's always quite baffling to me why they decided, why people decided, you know, why the Mormons decided that everyone gets their own planet, why the Scientologists believe the ludicrous things that they do about us having been descended from aliens that came here thousands of years ago in, in spaceships shaped like DC-10s. Why on earth would they come up with that? It's not in their interest. It's laughable. I agree. So, so, you know, the fact is that cults and religions do just come up with claims which are not particularly necessarily attractive to the people that want to believe them at the time. I, I All sorts of reasons for that. Um, I think that you also mentioned miracles and the woman um, being cured. Now, look, I, I'm not in any position to comment on that, but I can comment on one case that I know of, which is um, a friend of mine, well, uh, certainly a, a good acquaintance of mine, that I won't name and I won't embarrass him, but um, a long time ago now, he told me that what got him into Christianity was a miracle, um, that he used to have one leg a little bit longer than the other one. And that he saw the other leg grow due to the power of Jesus or whatever it was, so that they became the same length and he never had the kind of back problems that he used to have um, after that. Now, this, I know, is an old musical trick. And if you go on the internet, you can see it being done, right? He was duped. It wasn't a real miracle. Um, It's remarkably common in scare quotes, a miracle that Christians do um, to bring people on board and get them, uh, you know, in line with the faith. Um, and, and I didn't know what to say to him because I knew the truth and I knew he'd been duped, but I couldn't right. tell him. I couldn't the, bring myself funny to though, tell him. I, I, if I might butt in here with my view on this, I, I think there are definitely people who do who are charlatans on this front. But I have actually met people who said I had a le- leg that was less that were shorter than the other oh and God. i got prayed and and they went to a doctor had it measured and they had the before and the after and in fact the leg was the same now i'm going i did they didn't show me the medical records no, i'm just going didn't. on 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 what they told me and they said and yeah. my back problems cleared up etc etc the one so, leg shorter than so, the other <laughs> all right well, well is laughable the, well <laughs> the, that wasn't the example uh, you, jp gave of course jp no, you no, gave of course, it, it uh, maybe uh, the, maybe there are some legitimate cases maybe there's some real miracles but the 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 the, the <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't buy it. So. Okay, all right, <clears throat> JP. I'm gonna. Uh, we we do need to wrap this up, so I'm gonna give the last word to you and and uh, take us out uh, to our <laughs> to, to to the end of today's show. Well, uh, thank you, Stephen, for a lively discussion, and Justin, uh, for having me on. And I look forward to being at the conference coming up this summer. I would just say that my book, Scientism and Secularism, is an attempt to say that uh, a, a, a widespread, in my opinion, a widespread view that that science is the only way or the vastly superior way of knowing reality is irrational and that there are other ways of knowing uh, and there are a number of uh, facts that theism can explain uh, and that uh, naturalism or atheism has a very very difficult time uh, explaining but theism uh, uh, can explain so that's what I'm trying to 
make a case for in my book. And uh, that's what we've tried to discuss here today. We have. And we've gone into some very interesting territory. Lots of cans of worms open that we can't do justice to, like consciousness and why is there evil and miracles. Um, By the way, if you're interested in the miracle question, um, very interesting conference coming up soon that I will be hosting uh, out in Squim in Washington on uh, whether uh, looking at miracle claims with Christians and atheists present. Uh, That should be an interesting one. Uh, I'm sure you'll be interested to hear hear that one, Stephen. We've got... uh, uh, we've we've got um, a, a sceptic um, coming for that, for that debate. Michael Shermer will be involved, who I'm sure you're familiar with, I Stephen. Am, yes. uh, opposite, um, uh, opposite Luke Vanderway, who is going to be making the case for miracles. So, uh, Perhaps you can get him to do one. Well, well, <laughs> who knows? Who knows yeah. what might, <clears throat> might happen? Anyway, that's a, that's a side note. For now, um, I'm very much looking forward to, to having you here in the UK, JP, for Unbelievable the Conference 2019, Saturday 20th of July. Thank you very much for being on the show. All the best with the book. Stephen, thank you very much for coming in. Yeah, my and, pleasure. And crossing swords with JP. Yes, today. yeah, no, it was fun. And, uh, and I enjoyed the book. It was uh, it's certainly a very well-written book, even if I don't agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Sure. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Let me know what you thought by email. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Uh, you can find more details about my guests and also comment underneath today's show as well at the website too. premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable. Uh, thanks to those who've been uh, tweeting me as well in the last week um, with responses to some of the recent shows. Um, let's go to um, one or two of these. Uh, this was uh, a lovely one, actually, from uh, Sam Sam on Twitter, who says he's uh, in Halifax in his local uh, cafe shop reading the unbelievable book. Why, after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. You say loving and devouring it 26 percent in in one sitting. Thanks, Justin. Very accessible and helpful for people like me. Keep going. And I assume uh, by the fact you say you're 26 percent of the way in you're reading on a Kindle uh, there, Sam Sam. But thank you very much. Uh, available, of course, in signed physical copies as well from our website uh, that's uh, unbelievablebook.co.uk but a lot of people still tweeting on that show uh, that caused so much uh, interest a few weeks ago uh, which of course relates to the, the topic we were debating today uh, that was John Lennox and Peter Atkins on whether science can explain everything um, this one by Rick Barker said just listen to the show ding ding is right I felt Professor John Lennox was far more rational and grown up than Mr Atkins saying a Nobel Peace Prize winner needs to grow up due to his Christianity now that's childish Mr Lennox did his usual outstanding job thanks for airing it uh, this one from Jim said just listened John was very gracious and often commended Peter on his intellect though sadly Peter often displays such an arrogant and sarcastic attitude it didn't serve his discussion well and Elahi said fantastic conversation all due respect to Peter Atkins brilliance even if I were an objective observer which I admit I'm not I'd be so inspired by the gentle humility of John Lennox in the face of arrogant opposition I would want the spirit he has Uh, if you want to tweet your thoughts about today's show feel free to do that at unbelievable jb for the twitter facebook.com slash unbelievable jb for the facebook page where you can see what i post on a regular basis from the show and other places too and of course leave your comments there as well and um, still on that uh, atkins versus lennox debate kwan got in touch to say on email writing in from singapore been listening to that debate it's been quite fascinating great job moderating two heavyweights as for the debate i find atkins fundamentally contradicts himself he stands firmly that the god answer is a lazy get out clause however he also uses this same lazy method to push away philosophical questions that point to the purpose of the universe by lazily labeling them as nonsense questions it's quite clear why he does this considering his stand that he'd never changed his belief regardless of the evidence shown to him and towards the end of the debate i was quite pleasantly surprised the one thing i never understood about the atheist point of view is how they could redefine the idea of nothing as proposed by lawrence krauss and the fact that even an atheist like peter atkins doesn't believe in that redefinition goes to show how ridiculous a cop-out that explanation seems Um, you also want to say josh mcdowell is coming to your church to give a sermon in march um, I wouldn't have known about him if not for your programme. So I want to give a shout out for any more Singaporean listeners to come to Orchard Road Presbyterian Church on the 10th of March, 9am. There you go. If you're listening in Singapore, that's obviously the place to be. Going back a bit further to uh, the debate on consciousness, something we obviously touched on on today's show as well, but which we did in some depth, uh, a deep dive, as it were, uh, between Raymond Tallis and David Bentley Hart a few weeks ago. 
Uh, Mark Vernon on Twitter actually got in touch. Um, and Mark's someone who's uh, looked into this a great deal as well. I think it, in the space of a tweet, you very helpfully summed up some of the issues between them. Um, is there a difference this, you say? Raymond Tallis looks inside and sees one that a thing inexplicably after another. David Bentley Hart looks inside and one sees one thing after another and steady pure consciousness in whom the thoughts live, move, etc. And the mystery is why one doesn't see what's self-evident to the other. Uh, others wanted to weigh in on that debate, which which did get fairly uh, you know deep and philosophical and sometimes some have said impenetrable as well, at least uh, from David Bentley Hart's perspective that he was bringing. But Robert uh, says, um, a great show with David Bentley Hart and Raymond Tallis on the mystery of consciousness. I must admit a certain level of embarrassment that I found a great deal of the discussion going well over my head and I have a PhD in systematic theology. I can at least use the excuse that my area isn't philosophical theology. And I take heart that it seems that Tallis also had a hard time grasping what Hart was saying. I do appreciate Hart on a number of other fronts, however, such as his book Atheist Delusions and his poignant book on God and Suffering in The Doors of the Sea, Where Was God in the Tsunami? But I must take issue with his one slip in Christian charity when N.T. Wright was brought up. It is one thing to jokingly say who when you raised his name, but then to proceed to insult him by questioning whether the man was even a gentleman was a low blow, not appropriate from a believing Christian and poorly placed as it was irrelevant to the discussion. Churlish and uncalled for. Shame on him. No, I I took that as being a, a not a very serious uh, comment when he said that. If he is a gentleman, I, I took that as as being uh, tongue in cheek from David Bentley Hart. But uh, I I could see how it get, could get misconstrued. Anyway, glad you enjoyed the discussion, Robert. Um, and Peter on that uh, debate on consciousness says. A really interesting show. You continue to thrill and challenge with your choice of topics and guests. Looking forward to the rest of the 2019 lineup. One small criticism, though. I don't think we ever got to the overall nuts and bolts of Raymond Tallis's argument. He stated his premise very briefly at the beginning, but then it seemed like the show turned into more of a David Bentley Hart Q&A session. I felt bad for Dr. Tallis. He didn't get more time to talk about his book which, just as a reminder, is called Logos and is about uh, how we make sense of the world. I understand uh, that that's the way these shows go sometimes, but I've thought in the past that if you're having a guest on to discuss a book or idea, you should be given at least five uninterrupted minutes to clearly lay out their premise and supporting argumentation before letting the conversation partner in. Anyway, um, I hope to encourage you to just to simply improve upon the great work already happening. Thank you very much, Peter always taken in that spirit thank you very much um so yeah um your comments always welcome um whatever the show may be i'm sure we will probably do another edition with raymond tallis and allow him a little more space to expand on his view as an atheist of how he comes to terms with consciousness very different obviously to the way as uh, other atheists do like daniel dennett and so on but um, maybe maybe that's one jp morland could uh, could engage in as a as it's a subject we we started on but never really did justice to on today's show for the moment thank you very much uh, for being with me on today's edition of the show uh, do make sure to check out all the other great things you can find from unbelievable resources uh, videos apps newsletters and such you can find links to all of them from the unbelievable page at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable but the real thing i want you to do especially if you're based in the uk is make sure you get yourself booked in for unbelievable the conference 2019 very excited we're returning to central hall london and uh, we're going to be doing it in the company of some brilliant speakers including jp morland who we heard from today all the details available from our website go to premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable conference and let me tell you what's coming next week you're unbelievable it's the charismatic and cessationist debating whether tongues prophecy and other charismatic spiritual gifts are for today our charismatic will be andrew wilson our cessationist simon r scott they're going to have a great conversation hope you can join me for it same time next week You've been listening to the Unbelievable Podcast. Help others find the show by rating and reviewing us in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. And discover more shows from Premier at premier.org.uk slash podcasts.